Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There are some believers in the Bible that I envy because of the experiences that they had in their relationship with the Lord. Two that really jump off the pages of Scripture to me are Abraham and Moses. Abraham heard from the Lord multiple times God called him to go to a new land there was that one encounter where the Lord showed up at Abraham's tent with two angels and they ate a meal together at least Abraham and Sarah watched them eat what a what a great experience that would have been for Abraham there's also an event in his life when Abraham had a vision a dream and and the Lord told him to offer up the sacrifice a sacrifice and And Abraham cut it up, and then the Lord appeared as a flaming pot of fire. And Abraham was just watching this. That would be awesome. Or how about Moses? Right? Moses is the one who said, Lord, I want to see you. And God actually showed himself to Moses. He put him in that rock, and Moses saw the Lord pass by. Moses received the Ten Commandments, and his face glowed, reflecting the glory of the Lord, that would have been incredible. In that burning bush, remember that when the Lord called him? You're on holy ground, take off your shoes. And the Lord spoke to him. What a great experience. But there's another one in the Old Testament that I think would have popped them all. A man by the name of Jacob. He had two really cool experiences with the Lord. The first one, when he was running away from his brother Esau, he's sleeping on a rock, and he has this vision of a stairway to heaven. God gave him all these promises. And then about 20 years later, Jacob's going back, and he's about to meet Esau, and God shows up and wrestles with him. The Lord wrestles with Jacob, like hand to hand. And they all night long, they're wrestling together. And finally, the Lord says, okay, enough. And he touches his hip socket, and, and, and Jacob lets him go, and the Lord blesses him. It's been such a cool experience to wrestle with God. Or maybe just the Last Supper in the upper room with Jesus would be good. To be there with those disciples... To be in that upper room eating the Passover meal with the Lamb of God who's about to take away the sin of the world. We long for those connections with our God because he's a personal God. He makes his dwelling in us through faith. We want more of that. We don't need a stairway to heaven or a burning bush or a wrestling match with the Lord. We don't need to be there in the upper room because Jesus has made sure through his holy sacrament that we have a connection to him and we have a connection to each other. The two verses that the Apostle Paul wrote in the 10th chapter of Corinthians that we'll look at tonight teach us those very simple but very comforting truths. That communion connects us to Jesus and to each other. The congregation in the city of Corinth struggled with connections. It was a congregation that was made up of factions. Some followed Paul, some followed Apollos, some followed Jesus. When they came together for worship, the congregation was often divided socially, economically, racially, They had issues with spiritual gifts. Very gifted congregation, and they liked to let everybody know just how gifted they were. There's a lack of connection between these people. But that was only symptomatic of their greater issue, and that was their connection with the Lord. That was where their real issue was, with the God. They didn't remember who they were living for. They didn't focus on his word and letting the love of Christ be reflected in their relationship 
with each other. They needed to have that addressed. And so the Apostle Paul wrote the letter, the first letter of the Corinthians, to confront them with a lot of these sins. The sins that they were committing against one another, but finally the sins they were committing against God. Paul went through it all. The problems in their worship life, the problems in their church discipline life, the problems in their relationships with each other, their problems with the Lord. And then he taught them by, again about the Lord's Supper. It's interesting that in the Bible, there are four places that talk about the Lord's Supper. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in the book of 1 Corinthians. <coughs> the congregation in the city of Corinth had a lot of problems. And it's the one book of the Bible where the Lord addresses the truths about the Lord's Supper for this very troubled congregation because they needed to have that connection with Jesus strengthened. And that's exactly what the Lord's Supper was given for. Paul spent some time in chapter 10 and in chapter 11 teaching them again about the Lord's Supper. And in chapter 10, these two verses, he stresses what's being received in the Lord's Supper. Listen again to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Paul says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And the answer that Paul is expecting to both of those questions is, well, of course it is. Of course we're connected to Jesus' body and his blood in the Lord's Supper, because that's exactly what he says. That's often been a problem for Christians. Often been a problem for believers. How can this be? Imagine the first disciples that night in the upper room when Jesus said, take this, it is my body, this is my blood. What were they thinking? How could this be? You're sitting right there, Jesus. How can we receive your body and blood? Then they remember who it was that was speaking to them. And so do we. The very Son of God who created this world in six days. God who rules everything. Is the same God who promises that he delivers to us with the bread and wine, his very body and blood. What a connection. What a beautiful connection Jesus makes with us. The very things that he so willingly and joyfully laid down to win our salvation. He gives to us personally. This is my body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take it and eat it. Take it and drink. You have a connection to Christ in this blessed sacrament of Holy Communion. Because you receive that sacrament connected to your Savior, you also have a connection to the people you commune with. It's quite natural. Sinners who approach the altar to receive Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of sins do that together. Again, Paul teaches that to the Corinthians. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. It's a beautiful connection that Jesus gives to us as we receive the sacrament together as brothers and sisters in Christ. A connection that this world cannot give. A connection that you can't find in this world. It does not exist. If we've learned a few things the last year, one of them is our world is full of division. You've probably experienced it in the workplace, in a personal relationship, on social media, anger and, and discord and unrest because of things like politics and health, race, whatever the issue might be, there is deep division within our country. And even within the church, even among God's people, we sometimes fall victim to those things. We may not say it out loud, but we think it. We struggle with connections. And so we gather on Monday, Thursday, 
to be reminded of the beautiful connection we have with our Savior through his body and blood, and we get to express the connection we have with one another. When you take communion with a fellow Christian, you're confessing your deep need for a Savior, personally and corporately. We stand before God and nobody knows our sin except the Lord. We say some things out loud, but we know God sees our heart and our great need for forgiveness. And we look around our sanctuary and we see there are other people here with that same need. And we all find satisfaction in the same Savior, in his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. What a beautiful connection we have with one another in the sacrament. It's a connection you can't find anywhere else except in the gospel. Years ago, this connection was illustrated for me at a pastor's conference I attended. And I tell this story in our Bible information class. I may have shared it with some of you. I was at a conference in Tampa, Florida, and at this conference, uh, there were any number of pastors and teachers there, and there were some guests of the conference. Two men, one of them named uh, Jacob, and uh, one of them named, I think, Rabbi. I can't remember his first name, but he, was, he had been a Jewish rabbi. Jacob was from Iraq and was raised Muslim. And both these guys, the, the rabbi and the former Muslim, were now Christians, confessional Christians, members of our church body. I knew, knew neither of them, but I remember sitting up in the front of the church during that communion service and watching them come up for communion. They walked down the center aisle and, and they were on different sides and they communed together. What a beautiful connection. About 20 years ago, I was on the island of Puerto Rico, helping out with one of our mission churches there. Didn't know a lick of Spanish. Pastor Shones knows that because anytime a Spanish speaker comes, they go to his office because I direct them there. But I sat in a church service there in the island of Puerto Rico in our sister church down there communion service. Didn't understand a single thing that was said, but had connection to that congregation, to those people, to those brothers and sisters in Christ, because what Jesus gives us and what he uses to connect us to one another is greater. It's lasting. It's eternal. His very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That one loaf unifies this one body around the Savior and His Word. And that's exactly why we take time to have a service like this, to gather around His Word and Sacrament on Monday, Thursday, as we prepare to see what He's going to do for us tomorrow, as we get ready to run to the tomb on Easter Sunday. The death of Jesus Christ our Lord and the resurrection of our Savior assure us of the forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation and that is exactly what Jesus promises us in this sacrament. And so we always want to treasure it. We want to use it. We want to encourage our brothers and sisters with it. One month from tomorrow will be our confirmation Sunday here at Abiding Word, the first Sunday in May. Between services, our confirmands will share with us the, the faith that is in their heart as they confess it before our congregation. And then for the very first time, they'll receive the Lord's Supper with this congregation and express their unity. Be here in church that day. Or talk to them afterwards and say, welcome. A joy to take communion with you here at Abiding Word. Do that for somebody you don't know after service. A joy to be connected to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. One Savior, one body of believers and the distinct privilege of expressing it. You know, Jacob, when he wrestled with the Lord, walked with a limp for the rest of his life. God touched him in the socket of his hip, and, and from that point forward, Jacob didn't have a walker or a power chair, but he was limping. He remembered that. Probably a little bit painful, too. 
In our connection to the Lord, there's no pain. There's no hurt. It's a beautiful memory. Because it's the real thing. It's the real body and blood of Christ Jesus given and shed for us. It's the real connection between our fellow Christians. It's a real relationship with the Lord, and it lasts into eternity. Thank God that he's brought himself to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving yourself to us again and again in this holy sacrament. Help us to treasure it. Help us to share it. Help us to be encouraged by it tonight and throughout our Christian life. May God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen.